All right, Tina, I'll let you take the the reins from here, do your thing, and then when you're wrapped up, All right. I'll do mine. Hey, sounds great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tina Pashvich, and I'm the regional sales representative for Old Republic Exchange. We are a direct subsidiary of Old Republic title. You may be familiar with that name. And we act as a qualified intermediary for 1031 exchanges. So that's our specialty. That is all we do. And today I'm going to go over the very basics of an exchange. I'll go over the definition of an exchange. We'll talk about the many rules and regulations. And then we'll talk about the many benefits to you, uh, whether you're a realtor or a real estate investor, et cetera. So I will do a and a at the end. I often find that if we interject questions, oftentimes the answer might be on the very next slide. So uh, jot down your questions and I'm happy to have a discussion uh, afterward. So let's get started. What is a 1031 exchange? Well, it's simply the code designated by the IRS, code 1031. This code provides that a taxpayer may sell property and defer payment of any capital gains tax if that taxpayer uses the proceeds to acquire like-kind replacement property. So a couple of terms to pay attention to. The first one, the taxpayer is deferring that capital gains tax. They're kicking that can down the road. But you will see that there are substantial benefits to that tax deferment. And then the other term we'll talk about in more detail is like kind, but essentially we are referring to any type of real property held for investment purposes. Specifically, the code 1031 states that no gain or loss shall be recognized on the exchange of property held for productive use in a trade or business or for investment if such property is exchanged solely for property of like kind, which again, needs to be held either for productive use in a trade or business or for investment. Primary residences do not qualify for 1031 tax treatment. There is that primary residence exclusion, which is code 121. But again, 1031 exchanges are only for investment properties. And in order to qualify for this tax treatment, the IRS, of course, has many rules and regulations that must be followed. And one of the critical roles of the QI is to provide those guidelines to the taxpayer to set them up for a successful exchange. And those rules are set forth in the 1991 Treasury regulations, again, issued by the IRS. Exchanges have been around for 102 years. So there was a big birthday in the industry a few years ago. So it's not a newfangled tax law. However, they were refined and we are now bound by those regu uh, regulations that were set forth again in 1991. I always like to mention, oftentimes when you hear of a tax break, you think, oh, this must just be for that uh, wealthy real estate investor or that top 1%. Well, in fact, half of all exchanges are for properties less than $500,000. And I often see exchanges for properties less than $100,000. You can still have significant capital gain if you sell a property for $75,000, $85,000. This is a good time too to mention the equal or greater concept in a 1031 exchange. In order to defer 100% of your capital gains tax, you wanna roll all of your proceeds into a property equal or greater in value to the sales price of the property you're selling. So if I'm selling a property for $100,000, I wanna purchase a property that's at least $100,000. If I find a property I really like, it's only $90,000, I can do that. That's a partial exchange. And then you're on the hook for the taxes for that difference, that $10,000. But again, it's important to remember the equal or greater concept in a 1031 exchange. Why do a 1031 exchange? Well, first and foremost, capital gains taxes are fairly substantial. First, you have to look at your federal rate, and it's dependent upon your income. 
Most taxpayers fall into the 15% bracket. If you're a, a high earner, then you fall into the 20% bracket. Then you need to add your state uh, tax rate to that. And every state is different. If you're lucky enough to live in Texas, that's 0%. If you're lucky or unlucky enough to live in California, that's 13.3%. Uh, in Pennsylvania, I believe it's fairly low. I have to look that one up again, but I think it's about 3.05%. So that's uh, a little bit lower than many states. But again, if you're at 15%, you're going to add that 3%, right? So you're already at 18%. And if you uh, are, again, depending on your income, you may need to add an additional 3.8% for the Medicare surtax. So then you're, you know, um, over 20%. So capital gains taxes can be a fairly shocking number at times. So rather than paying Uncle Sam, you could reinv uh, reinvest those dollars. Leverage your own money in essence. Use your own money to possibly purchase a more expensive property or multiple properties. So the idea, again, is use your own money, leverage those dollars into a replacement property, and therefore building up that real estate portfolio and possibly real estate wealth. I always like to say to the real estate investor who is not familiar with the 1031 exchange, let me introduce you to your new best friend. That so, And you will see why. Another benefit, transfer to an income producing property. What I mean here is perhaps an investor owns a vacant plot of land and they're holding on to that, it's appreciating in value, that's fantastic. Well, you could sell and exchange that into perhaps a duplex or an apartment complex, a type of property that's going to generate rental income, for example. Also, you have the ability to diversify and minimize risk to that real estate portfolio. Portfolio, You are able to invest in residential real estate, commercial real estate, and anywhere in the United States. So, you know, anywhere geographically in the United States is considered like kind property. So perhaps you want to move your, your line of business, maybe from Pennsylvania to a warmer state in Florida. You can do that with a 1031 exchange. Some of the terms you'll hear throughout the presentation, the relinquished property or the RQ, that's the property being sold in the exchange, the replacement property or the RP, that's the property being acquired in the exchange. We're gonna talk about the identification period, that's the 45 day period following close of the sale of that relinquished property in which the taxpayer or exchanger is required to provide a list of possible replacement properties. We're gonna talk about the exchange period. That's the full 180 day period following close of the sale of that relinquished property in which the exchanger must close on their purchased property. And then we'll talk about the G6 restrictions. That's the specific section of the regulations that state when an exchanger is entitled to receive proceeds. One of the critical functions of a qualified intermediary is to hold and control the funds so that you, the taxpayer or exchanger, does not touch or have access to the money. And we'll talk more about that in a few slides from now. I mentioned the IRS has many rules and regulations. Well, what are they? First rule, the properties being sold and purchased must be held for investment purposes. Again, primary residences do not qualify for 1031 tax treatment. There is that primary residence exclusion I'm sure you're familiar with, and that's uh, code 121. You must use the services of a qualified intermediary. Uh, that's what we do. We provide safe harbor uh, and you know, again, uh, prevent that exchanger from touching the money and or disqualifying the exchange. Number three, the exchanger may not have actual or constructive receipt of the exchange proceeds during the exchange period, which makes number four critical to a successful exchange. 
the exchange agreement must be entered into on or before the closing date of that relinquished property. Essentially, the exchange has to be set up prior to closing, prior to title transferring, and prior to any funds uh, moving. So let's say I have closed on my investment property. I wasn't thinking of utilizing an exchange. It was not even an in-person uh, closing, right? And this check uh, is laying on my attorney's desk or the title agent's desk. I've never laid eyes on it. I certainly haven't cashed it. Well, I wake up the next morning and I decide, you know, I really should use an exchange. And I, this property right here that I saw online looks fantastic. I want to exchange. Well, at that point, it's too late because I have access to those funds. Again, even though I haven't touched the, the check, haven't deposited the check, the fact that I have access would make the exchange non-negotiable. This wouldn't be possible. So again, it's critical that the exchange be set up prior to closing. We prefer a 48-hour notice. However, we've often, not often, but it's not totally uncommon to get a call from the closing table and more often than not, we can get the exchange set up fairly quickly. But again, um, must be done at exchange agreement, must be signed prior to closing. The fifth rule, the taxpayer must identify in writing potential properties that will be the replacement property in the exchange. This identification must be done within 45 days of the closing of that relinquished property. Very strict timeline. And then finally, the rule, uh, the number six, rule number six, the taxpayer must complete the purchase of the identified replacement property or properties within 180 days of the closing of that relinquished property. These are calendar days. So weekends and holidays count. If you are closing on uh, the, if your 180th day happens to fall on a weekend or holiday, you need to close prior to that. And again, very strict rules that IRS does not grant extensions. And a good QI will send you reminders of your 45 identification date, as well as that 180th uh, exchange period date. However, ultimately it is up to that taxpayer to be aware and, uh, and complete within those timelines. What are the rules of identification? The first one, and most utilized is your three property rule. This is where you are able to identify up to three properties regardless of their values. You can uh, acquire one, two, or all three, depending on what your game plan is. Perhaps you really just want to exchange one property for one property. Well, you could identify three, and this way you have a few backup options if, for example, your first, your, your first choice falls through for whatever reason. So again, three properties of any value. If you identify more than three properties, then that falls under the 200% rule. That is where you can identify any number of properties as long as the combined fair market value does not exceed 200% of all the relinquished properties. So if I'm selling a property for $100,000, I can identify any number of properties as long as those combined values do not exceed $200,000. So the three property rule and the 200% rule. When we send out identification documents, we ask that you select one of those two rules. If for whatever reason you did not select a rule, We'll, we'll, we'll notice that and alert you, but let's say for some reason you're working with uh, another QI, you did not select a rule, then that falls into the 95% exception. This is where you can identify any number of properties without regard to value, provided that 95% of the value of all the identified properties is acquired. Now, this is next to impossible too aggressive and very much prone to failure. Imagine you've identified six or seven properties. You'd have to be sure that you were able to close on all of those properties. If one of them did close, then your exchange would fail. So again, you need to focus on the three property rule or that 200% rule. And again, a good qualified intermediary will review your identification statement, approve it, and again, set you up for a successful exchange. 
let's take a look at that delayed exchange timeline at zero days. I have close of the first relinquished property. If you want to sell multiple properties and combine them into one exchange, you can do that. But you need to be mindful that the clock starts ticking at the close of that first property. From that date, then you have 45 days. Again, these are calendar days to provide that written identification of possible replacement properties and a total of 180 days to close. And I have close of the last replacement property. If you're gonna purchase more than one, again, you can do that, but they all must close within that 180 day exchange period. And as you can see from the timeline, it's not 45 days plus 180 days. The exchange period is that 180 days. Again, IRS very strict with these timelines. They do not grant extensions. The 45th day ends at midnight on that 45th day after the date the exchanger transfers that relinquished property. So if you're closing on September 12th, that calculation starts the very next day on the 13th. And like I mentioned before, if your 180th day happens to fall on a weekend or holiday, you need to close prior to that weekend or holiday. So that's a quick look at the delayed exchange timeline. There are four methods of exchanging. The first and most utilized is your standard delayed exchange. That's where you're selling that relinquished property. And then within 180 days, you complete the purchase of your new property or replacement property. There's the simultaneous exchange. That's where those closings happen on the same day. That's permitted. However, technically the property you're selling most close first and then the purchase. But again, it can happen the same day. With a delayed and simultaneous exchange, the contracts are simply assigned to the qualified intermediary. There's direct deeding, we are never on title. Contracts are simply assigned to the qualified intermediary. And I mentioned that because the reverse exchange and construction exchange provide quite a contrast. They're much more complex. So we'll start with the reverse exchange. The reverse exchange is just as it appears, it's in reverse order. So you're purchasing that replacement property before you have sold your relinquished property. Same timelines are in play. You're gonna close on the property you wish to purchase. You have that 45 day window to identify the property you're gonna sell and a total of 180 days to sell and close on that relinquished property. <clears throat> this is a good option. If, for example, you found a property of your dreams, you don't want to miss out on that property, and you haven't sold that relinquished property, or perhaps you're obligated, you're under contract, you're obligated to purchase that property, and your relinquished property hasn't sold. So there is the reverse exchange option. What makes this different from a delayed or simultaneous is that the qualified intermediary is required to form an exchange accommodation title holder and hold title to one of the properties in the exchange. And the reason is, is the taxpayer or exchanger cannot own two properties at once when utilizing an exchange. So with the reverse exchange, the QI jumps in and holds title. They're much more complex, much more work, and much more expensive. And you'll see this across the board with um, qualified intermediaries. Roughly a fee for a delayed or simultaneous is around 1,500 to 2,200. A reverse exchange starts at 8,500. And you'll have multiple closing costs as uh, we are required then to convey title back to the taxpayer. So there's two closings. Having said that, depending on what your capital gains tax looks like, it still may be worthwhile. Then there's the construction or improvement exchange. This is where you're selling that relinquished property. And again, the QI jumps in, holds title to that replacement property while proceeds are used to construct improvements. Let's say I'm selling a property for $500,000 and I find a fixer upper that is $250,000. Well, if you remember that equal or greater concept, I have that $250,000 I need to make up. Well, I can use those towards capital improvements, but only under the construct of an improvement exchange. 
In this case, the QI holds title to that replacement property. The taxpayer has access to that property and they act as the manager. So they're gonna send the contractor's invoices directly to the QI. The QI pays the contractors directly. Why is this important? Again, the taxpayer cannot touch any of the funds during the exchange period, otherwise the exchange will fail. This is why if you have that excess $250,000, you can't just simply cash out and use it towards those improvements without using the improvement exchange. If you do it that way, you're gonna be taxed on that $250,000. So the improvement exchange is a good option if you have excess proceeds that you wish to use towards capital improvements. This is uh, not for repairs, it's not for new carpet or painting, that kind of thing, but capital improvements. Construction exchange is $9,500, again, just to serve and provide a little bit of contrast. So those are the four methods of exchanging. And again, your standard delayed exchange is the most utilized. What qualifies as like kind? Essentially, any type of real property that is held for investment qualifies. It's a very broad and liberal term. You could exchange a single family home for a multifamily home, a vacant a piece of vacant land for a strip mall, or perhaps you want to change up your business and exchange a hotel for, uh, for a farm. The physical characteristics do not need to be identical. You do not need to exchange an apartment building for an apartment building or a residential property for a residential property. Again, very broad and liberal term, essentially any type of real property held for investment purposes qualifies. And also any property in the United States qualifies as like kind. Unfortunately, you cannot exchange a property in a foreign country for another property in the United States. Again, uh, like kind is United States to United States. Be excluded from a 1031 exchange. Any stock and trade or other property held primarily for sale. What is held primarily for sale? I'm often the bearer of bad news when I get a phone call from a house flipper. Flips typically do not qualify for 1031 tax treatment because they're held primarily for sale as opposed, as opposed to primarily for investment. So the idea, the intent is to get in there, fix it up and get it back out onto the market as quickly as possible. So that again is held primarily for sale and do not qualify for an exchange. Dealer held lots is another example that the idea there is to, to sell them to a builder. It's not to hold for investment purposes. So again, uh, that is a type of property that is excluded from using a 1031. Any bonds or notes, um, occasionally we'll see a seller that's offering the buyer seller assistance. And if that is done a certain way and paid back within the exchange period, then you can defer that money. Then any sort of note or installment note that is beyond the exchange period, for example, a one to two or to three year installment note, any money outside of that exchange period will be deemed taxable. Any sort of uh, other securities or evidences of indebtedness or interest, interest in a partnership do not qualify. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about partnership uh, interest in the next slide. Partnerships can exchange, but it gets a little dicey when uh, not all the members wish to exchange. Any certificates of trust or beneficial interest, if anyone has an action against your property, that would not qualify. And again, excuse me, not again, but personal property does not qualify. When the new tax laws came about in 2017, uh, that eliminated the ability to exchange uh, airplanes that were used in business, for example, or farm equipment. Uh, so since those changes again in 2017, it's only real property held for productive use in a business or trade or for investment. Potential hazards in a 1031 exchange. The first one, vesting. There's a very important rule in a 1031 exchange, and that is the same taxpayer rule. 
However, the property that you are selling is titled must be how you acquire that replacement property. So if Joe Smith is on title to that relinquished property, then Joe Smith only must be on title to that replacement property. Well, let's say Joe Smith was single when he purchased that relinquished property and he wants to add his wife to title on that replacement property. Well, that's a problem. And the IRS will look at that as a 50% gift to his wife, and that would be deemed taxable. Whenever we set up an exchange, we require a copy of the most recently recorded vesting deed or the title commitment to verify vesting, again, to uh, set you up for a successful exchange. But that same taxpayer rule is critical to a successful exchange. So that brings me to partnership interest. ABC partnership sells, ABC partnership must acquire. Well, what happens when there's a member of the partnership that just wishes to cash out and not utilize an exchange, not invest in any more real estate? Well, that's, that's a problem. There is a strategy that's referred to as the drop and swap. That's where you're gonna drop out into a tenant in common interest. And that way each individual can do what they wish. They can cash out or they can utilize an exchange. The only issue with dropping out of the partnership is anytime you make changes soon before an exchange, the IRS may feel that you haven't met what they refer to as this qualified use period. They don't come out and say you have to own a property for said number of months or years for it to qualify as an investment property. There are many factors that are considered. However, most CPAs and tax advisors recommend a one-year, one-day holding period. So anytime we set up an exchange and we notice title has been held for less than a year, we send out that qualified use audit disclosure. It's not unusual. I see a drop and swap probably once a month. We'll set that exchange up, send out that uh, audit disclosure. And again, it's the taxpayer's risk to bear. However, um, it is, like I said, a strategy that's not completely uncommon. Uh, this, this dilemma occurs uh, often. So again, that's one strategy you can use. Um, there's also the swap and drop. You can uh, exchange as the partnership. And once you've acquired that replacement property, then you drop out at that time. I do have a great article on partnership transactions that uh, you can find on our website if you do want more information, because that's a, a pretty popular topic. Any carryback financing, I mentioned that earlier, if the seller is providing any sort of financing in the form of a note to the buyer, if you want to defer that money, it must be included in that exchange period, be paid back during the exchange period, and there are very uh, strict directions on how that note must be handled. Uh, for example, the note must be written in the name of the qualified intermediary. Repair work. We always review the settlement statement prior to closing. And if we notice any funds uh, being uh, going towards repair work, we bring that to the taxpayer's attention because that would be deemed taxable. So anytime we see repair work, we suggest that you bring out side funds. That is not considered like kind property. So again, repair work um, you want to pay for outside of exchange. Related parties. I mentioned uh, not too long ago that the IRS does not really come out and say how long you must own a property for it to be considered held for investment purposes. The IRS really looks at your intent and multiple factors. Well, with related parties, they did enact a two-year holding requirement. So if my mother, for example, has an investment property and I want to purchase that from her as an investment property, I can do so, but I will need to hold on to that property for a minimum of two years. And my mother would need to utilize an exchange into another investment property and hold on to her property for a minimum of two years and the reason the IRS enacted these laws is to because uh, families, some families were shifting their basis and therefore avoiding taxes. So this is very strict. They're highly scrutinized. If you use an exchange, you're going to be asked directly, did you use an exchange? Yes. Did you exchange with the related party? Yes. 
who was that related party and what is their social security number. If one member of that party does not hold on to their property for that minimum two years, then both exchanges can fail. So again, you can exchange with the related party, but you need to be made aware of the very, very strict guidelines. Another thing we look for in the settlement statement are, are, are any non-exchange related costs. Oftentimes we'll see, for example, prorated rents. That's not exchanging for real property. You want to uh, bring that outside of the exchange if possible. So again, any the easy way to remember is any amount not exchanged for like kind property is more than likely gonna, going to be deemed taxable boot. And lastly, that pest Ski holding requirement. Tina, how long do I have to own a property for it to qualify? Again, IRS doesn't come out and say how long. They're going to look at your intent at the time you acquired it. If you have a history of flipping and you've held a property for four months, I would not recommend a 1031 exchange. And also, if you have owned your property for less than a year, Touch base with your CPA or tax advisor to discuss your situation. Again, uh, most CPAs or a majority of CPAs, tax advisors, recommend a minimum one year, one day holding period. And for some properties, it's a two year requirement. And we won't uh, dig too deeply into that. But again, always good to consult with your CPA if you're kind of in that gray area as far as uh, how long you've owned that property. The benefits of a 1031 exchange, first and foremost, as you saw, you are deferring your capital gains tax, again, kicking the can down the road, but there are substantial benefits to that deferment. So you can use your own money to leverage for wealth building, so you can build up that real estate portfolio, buy more expensive properties, multiple properties, et cetera. You can also relocate your assets, whether it be in different classes of real estate or a different uh, geography. Again, it can be commercial, it can be residential, and again, anywhere in the United States. And another great uh, uh, benefit is the estate tax planning benefit. If uh, an exchanger has an investment property and they pass away, their heirs receive that property on a stepped up basis. So if they sell right away, they do not have to pay any capital gains tax. If they hold on to that property, for example, for five years and then sell, they are only on the hook for the tax for those five years. And let me add, there's no limit to the number of times you can use an exchange. You can just keep, keep, keep going. So again, it's a great estate tax planning tool. What do we do as a qualified intermediary? Well, it is a requirement that you use that middleman this means that we acquire that relinquished property from the exchanger, transfer it to the buyer, and same with the, release, uh, the replacement property. We prepare all the documents. This includes the exchange agreement, the assignment of both sales contracts for the relinquished and replacement properties. We consult with the exchanger's tax advisor if that is requested. As a qualified intermediary, we're not provided or uh, uh, we're not permitted, I should say, to provide tax advice. We are not tax experts. We can certainly provide guidelines and we're certainly uh, able to consult and have uh, you know, meetings with your tax advisor. But again, we are not permitted to give tax advice. We execute the closing documents as the principal. This means as the seller in that relinquished property closing and then as the buyer in that re uh, replacement property closing, and again, one of our critical functions is to hold the exchange proceeds to prevent the exchanger from touching the money. And of course, we'll coordinate with closing agents, real estate agents, tax and legal advisors. And finally, the last thing you want to do when selecting a qualified intermediary is a Google search. There is a history of fraud in the industry and some pretty scary stories. So you wanna look for obviously a reputable company, a company that's in compliance and familiar with the code, an experienced company and a financially secure company. You wanna look for a company typically tied to a larger bank or a larger title company. Old Republic Exchange's uh, parent company, Old Republic International, this slide's a little outdated, has close to $24 billion in assets you also want to make sure the qualified intermediary is bonded and insured and can prove it. 
Old Republic Exchange has a 50 million errors and emissions policy and a $120 million fidelity bond covering any acts of dishonesty or fraud. And I'm proud to say that's the highest in the industry. And that's not something we just simply pay for because we want to have the highest. It is something that is earned. And that's due in large part to us being a direct subsidy of that larger company, which is a Fortune 500 company and very, very financially secure. So you can be assured that your money is safe and secure. My contact information, I'll mention our website again, oldrepublicexchange.com, has a few great videos uh, that you can view. We have a great library if you want more information on a reverse exchange and improvement exchange. Again, that article on partnership distributions is a popular one. There's information on related party exchanges. And also there's a do the math calculator. So if you wanna punch in some numbers and see what uh, an exchange might look like versus a standard sale, that's kind of a fun way to kind of have an idea of the power or the leverage of a 1031 exchange. So that concludes the PowerPoint presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. That was awesome, Tina. Yeah, I, I have a few. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Kevin has one. You can just ask. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, Hi, Tina. Kevin Crane here. I just made a couple of notes. Uh, first off, thank you very much for presenting the information. Uh, I can see the value My pleasure. in this type of a program. Will and I have talked about this before. Um, you discussed the identification period of 45 days and the exchange period of 180 days. Um, and I understand, as you mentioned, IRS does not grant an extension. So my question would be, what if for some reason, uh, somewhere along the line, whether it be during the 45 day period or the 180 day period, something goes awry? Most things probably it won't happen, but just say that it does. Is there anything that precludes us from actually starting over? So that's a great question. And I have, uh, I have two points that I like to make. First of all, if in that first 45 days, there's an issue with one of the properties you've identified or you've simply changed your mind, you can make changes to your identification. You would need to revoke the previous identification and replace it with another, but it has to be done in that 45 day window. Now let's say we're beyond that 45 day window. At that point, you cannot make changes. You are required to close on a properly identified property, or if there's an issue and you cannot, then you need to wait until the 181st day. It's simply a failed exchange and your funds minus the QIs fees are returned to you. Now, in uh, my presentations, I, I often quick. say there, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Just wanted to clarify, if something uh -huh. does go wrong, uh, we can actually redo, I guess, the deal, if you will, but we would have to wait the 180 day period to start over. Correct. Correct. Now, so I, I did say the IRS does not grant extensions. And <clears throat> I always like to mention too, the qualified intermediary is powerless <clears throat> in granting any extensions. And I mentioned that because I'm, I'm, I hear many sob stories and I, I do have empathy, but uh, but there are occasions, let's say you're beyond that 45 day window and you identified a property in Fort Myers, Florida, and it was uh, destroyed by a hurricane. There are those occasions where the IRS will rule and grant an extension and they do that fairly quickly and will send out the, the, the dates that they have permitted for extensions. So again, it's rare and it would be something of that nature, a natural disaster that would cause the IRS to come out and grant these, these exceptions and extensions. But beyond that, you are correct. Uh, if there's you know something, an issue where you aren't able to close on a replacement property during that exchange period, you know, you have to hold uh, hold on and wait for your money until that 181st day. It's a failed exchange and then you know you go through the process again. Thank you. Would you have to pay taxes on it at that point? Does it become capital gains? It would become capital gains tax, yes. It's a failed exchange. You end up paying your taxes. Yeah. So I have a couple questions. Uh, 
most of which you answered after I wrote them down, but um, because it was a great presentation. But uh, a few things: Sure. if you're if you're selling one property, are you able to roll it into multiple properties of equal or greater value? So you know you're selling a property for a hundred, but you buy a package of properties equating to two hundred. Does that count? Yes, it sure does. Yeah, and that's that's a, a common strategy. That's a, a a way for people to build up that real estate portfolio and buy smaller properties that they're generating rental income. So yes, the answer is true. You just need to be mindful of those uh, you know identification rules whether it's the three property rule or the 200% rule, but yes, you can purchase multiple properties. It, go, it works both ways too. You can sell a couple of properties and then combine the proceeds into one property. So yes, works both ways. Okay. And to, to piggyback on the 200% rule, I, I think I might've misunderstood that, but are you saying mm -hmm. you're not allowed to buy something that's worth more than 200% of what you sold? If you identify more than three properties, then that does fall under the 200% rule. So yes, if you identify four or more properties, the total values cannot exceed 200% or two times the value of the property that you're selling. Got it. But three and under, it doesn't matter. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then... And just uh, to back up a little bit, um, I misspoke when I said you start over. You've already sold that relinquished property so that that's not going to work out for the exchange just to clarify and you end up paying your taxes okay and yeah. um yeah honestly the other questions you answered during the the uh presentation you have a question chris hi tina uh my name is chris leva hi I just want to say thanks for the presentation it was uh, very helpful very uh educational um, I do have a question. I don't know if this was already answered, but let's say you identify three properties within the 45 day period. Um, and then after the 45 days is up, what happens if you lose out on, you know, all three bids of the properties that you chose? Are you able to then go back and pick another three properties or is the exchange just done at that point? Yes. Once you're beyond that 45 day window, you cannot make changes. So in that uh, in, in that scenario, yeah, you're, it would be a failed exchange. Hey, Tina, my name is Chris. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I want to explore the family rule. Um, okay. I, uh, what I'm going to be using a 1031 exchange on is uh, selling one of my properties, one of my investment properties here and buying an investment property down the shore. Now, I have a uh, closing date down the shore at the end of November, and my house just went on the market, you know, yes, today, here. Okay. Uh, so if I don't okay. sell it in the next, like, two weeks, if I don't get an agreement sale in the next two weeks, chances are I'm going to miss that deadline down the shore. Uh, so... I was not particularly worried because I have a sister who said she would just buy the property off me, you know, quick settlement and then put it right back on the market and she would sell it. Mm. And you're telling me Can't that that, that. Would, that yeah. would be illegal or whatever would nullify. Yeah. That. In fact, that scenario is specifically listed in, in the, the guidelines as, yeah. as a no, no, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just want to check. Yeah. Don't take that off the list. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that, that brings up another. Oh, question. I've heard I've heard a lot of creative strategies. So you're you're <laughs> not alone. Another question, Nzita. Um, I've heard of a reverse 1031 exchange. Um, yeah, she did cover that. Might have been before you got yeah, it. Yeah. Um, so how would that work in that scenario? Could he use that to to work around that? Good. Yeah, that would definitely be an option. So you would, uh, you know, set up the reverse exchange. The qualified intermediary uh, would hold title to that replacement property um, you'd have you know have to officially identify the property you're going to sell in 45 days which doesn't sound like it would take 45 days and then you would have a total of 180 days to sell your 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 relinquished property so to speak so yes the reverse exchange sounds like 
you know, an option. And typically for a, re a reverse exchange, we like a two week notice. So, you know, you, you still have time to try to sell your place and use a delayed exchange. But if you're getting close, you know, I'd say three weeks out, then you may, you know, might be a good time to explore that reverse option. Gotcha. Or ask for an extension, right? Well, that yeah. would be what I would do. Yeah, yeah. Really, at the end of the yeah. day, I think if I get an agreement of sale before the end of November, I think she will extend. Yeah. So, so please. Yeah. All right. Anyone, does anyone on the Zoom have any questions for Tina, Tamika, or Pam? No. no, no, I don't. It was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll appreciate the invitation again. And um, sure. Happy to do it. Awesome. Oh, All right. Yeah, thanks. Hey, well, I got oh, one yeah. One oh, sure. Question. One more question. Yep. Um, okay. So, so sure. real quick, my, my father, he owns uh, two uh, properties down at the shore. He's always talked about maybe selling both of them and then, you know, upgrading to, you know, a bigger property that's, you know, all of one property. Could he uh, potentially do an exchange like that? Would that technically be like kind or no? So um, we lost the connection. I heard that your father has two properties. Um, I kind of lost you after that. What was the question? So my father has two properties down at the shore and he's always talked about possibly selling okay. both of them and then going to upgrade to a bigger vacation home. So right now, currently he rents out the bottom um, and we typically just use the top for family. So if he would sell both of those and then, then go want to buy, uh, let's just say a bigger property that's just for us, would the 1031 exchange be an option? Not if the replacement property is solely for personal use. Okay. Now the IRS does permit vacation homes, but there are very strict parameters. Uh, briefly, um, you would have to rent that property out a minimum of 14 days a year for two consecutive years, and then get this, not use it more than 14 days a year for two consecutive years, or not more than 10% of the number of days you rent it. So if you can follow that plan for two years, then you can convert it into your vacation or permanent vacation home. But you would have to meet that, that two-year requirement or those parameters first. So you said, you yeah, repeat that, repeat those three parameters. Yeah, so, that, so second homes do not qualify for 1031 exchanges. You know, you're going in there using it maybe four or five months out of the year. But vacation homes, the IRS has designated vacation homes as an option, but they have very strict rules. And the rules are you must rent out that property a minimum of 14 days a year for two consecutive years, and then limit your personal use. You cannot use it more than 14 days a year for two consecutive years or you cannot use it more than 10% of the number of days you've rented the property out. So you can, you have to show some rental income and limit your personal use for two years. After you've met that burden, then you no longer have to rent it and it can become your family vacation home. Just a thought, could, could, could it be rented to my family members? You can rent to family members. The IRS likes to see fair market uh, value. And also, and I would touch base with your tax advisor. Uh, a, you know, I've heard from a lot of advisors that they also prefer a, uh, a long-term rental, like one year when it's with a family member. So touch base with your CPA, but, but yes, on the, the fair market and possibly it would need to be a long-term. And on our website too, we have an article on vacation homes. Tina, Kevin Crane back there again. On the same topic, this may be splitting hairs, but if the IRS says you cannot use the property um, more than a certain period of time within the first two years, just how does the IRS verify that? And I only ask because I'm a retired federal agent. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> 
I'm not trying to get anybody. Well, I don't think the IRS. Just, just how would they I don't think they. That? Yeah, I don't think they show up on your doorstep with a clipboard and, and count. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, there are ways, I guess, if they were really, really seriously counting or wanting to know if, you know, you're using your credit card in that region, I suppose, um, you know. That, that's a good question. Um, again, they're not knocking on your door counting. So yeah. that's also a question for maybe your, your tax person. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Sure. Right, well, I don't awesome. mean to be vague on purpose. <laughs> no, no. That's that's what the yeah. IRS does too. So. <laughs> we don't want to be. We don't want to be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Awesome. All right, Tino, thank you very much for this. And uh, we'll uh, yeah. go off and head off for the night and I'll hey. finish up with these guys here. Hey, thanks again. And uh, great questions. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank so uh, that was awesome. Thanks, Tina, for presenting that for us. Uh, it's weird views. Um it's like this thing. It's like she's in this room. It seems like. Um, so uh, the 1031 thing, it's complicated, but I like it because I see it as kind of the game of Monopoly. You know, like when you start thinking about real estate and why certain people do certain things and certain companies do certain things and you hear about these rules, you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's made for this purpose, right? It's always bigger, 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 right? Because if you understand like economics, your dollar yesterday is worth less than your dollar today, always, right? So you're playing that game constantly, you get it and you'll get ahead, right? Um, and if you look at it like a game, which let's face it, things are more fun when you gamify them, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a golfer, but I enjoy top golf, you know, right? It's a game, you know, and I, I suck at it, but it's a game, right? Uh, everything gamified is fun. Well, not everything, but most things, right? I'm going to gamify torture, but, you know, like there's things that can't be fun gamified. Uh, you might know, but, you know, um, but, uh, you know, so. Like you just haven't done it really right. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all fair. Um, but that's why I really enjoy the concept of the 1031 because the first, you know, if anyone's really honest with you, the first three to five years of building up an investment portfolio is painful, right? Like it's just pulling hair. Like you're just, oh my God, it's problem after problem, learning how to deal with tenants, learning how to screen the right tenants, learning how to evaluate properties, learning how to deal with issues. It's and learning is a good thing, but when it costs you constantly, it's painful, right? And you're just constantly like, man, when does this start to work? When do I get to the point that I could post that video on Instagram of me in a Maserati, you know, <laughs> not like you know, driving with my, you know, like to my boat, you know, like like those guys, you know, and you're yeah, and you're just like, when does that actually ever happen? And it really doesn't. It takes a long time to get there. A lot of those people are renting in those Maseratis. They don't actually own them. Although Maseratis aren't that expensive, some of them at least. But, you know, so it's a lot of fluff. But eventually, and they start to think, like, well, how, how do people get to 100, 300, 8,000 units, you know? And it's just constantly snowballing and building and building. And if the IRS were to tax you every time you built, people just wouldn't build, right? So they're allowing them to build. It's the same concept as like people complain when they let an Amazon build a warehouse and they don't charge them any taxes, right? Well, that warehouse also created 5,000 jobs for that neighborhood. And now all those people are going to spend money there, which now infuses money into that ecosystem. So that's because Amazon, that business, you know, decided to put something there, right? Um, so when you sell your triplex, take the equity and go buy a 10 unit, you're creating housing for 10 people versus three, right? So they want you to do that because you've now, you've 
mastered this. All right, let's implement you into this, right? We're going to have you continue to create housing for people. And pay, you're paying taxes. I mean, you're paying property taxes. You're paying insurance. You're paying, you know, all of the people that are doing work on your property are, you know, are paying taxes on the money you pay them. So it's not like you're never paying taxes. You know, a lot of people say you pay zero taxes when you have, you can write off the, you could uh, deduct a property for 27 years. Yeah, you're not paying taxes on the income you've earned, but you're paying a lot of taxes in other places, right? So the game of the 1031 is always, how do you keep rolling up while building your portfolio? And if you can get through that painful start, which not, it's not painful for everybody. It was super painful for me. If I had to start over, I would do everything on the opposite. But now that I'm understanding and playing the game a different way, you start to see it, right? And when you start to do things like 1031 exchanges, you're like, okay, I get where this is going, right? I now know why I didn't take any income for four years, you know, off of this. I've waited to stabilize and get to this point where I could roll this into something bigger. And now all of a sudden there's the cash flow, right? I'm not saying that is the right way, but that's just one way, right? Um, so before we jump into, you know, I have a normal grid presentation I do for these things. I'm going to forego that for this one because it's going to be a lot of the same stuff she went over. Um, but I do want to do some of the upfront things we normally do just so people get to know each other, understand your experience levels, what you do, who you are. Um, so, you know, we'll do that real quick. So like I said, I'm not going to do the entire, uh, All right, so just again, what grid is grid is, uh, and it really does this like because I'll give you an example. I had a grid leader from Pittsburgh reach out to me because he saw me on one of their internal meetings, and he's like, "Hell, I heard you bought you know a, a, you you bought a building in Pittsburgh. Like, are you know are you looking?" And he's like, "I'm a I'm connected with all the wholesalers. I can send you deals." And I was like, "Oh, cool, send them over." Now I can't have no time to evaluate them right now. But he's sending me stuff and I'm like, oh, I have this backlog of potential properties. And now I'm thinking, well, it's so hard to find flips around here because it's overpriced and everything's super expensive. But I'm seeing houses I can buy in Pittsburgh for 50 grand and sell them for 180. Right. So with so with work. So like those were the deals you used to get in Delaware County. Ten, you know, well, like 2011, obviously through 2000, say 19, you could find things like that. You don't anymore, right? Uh, and then pre, you know, the housing expansion, like pre 2001, you would find things like that. I mean, you hear the stories of guys buying row homes in Sharon Hill for 30 grand or whatever. Not anymore, right? But there's markets that have that still. And if you're willing to get out there, you just need to connect, right? And it, networks like this are built for that. It's connection with people all around the country. Get involved in real estate uh, groups. You know, that's how you're going to build your portfolio. So that's what Grid's for. Uh, to connect, learn from, collaborate with like-minded people. Uh, experience, er, investors of all experience levels. Who am I? You guys know. Go over this. Uh this is where, you know, I want you guys to kind of introduce yourself to each other, who you are, what you're doing, how you could potentially help each other. Um, so, you know, start with Mark. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Brown. I'm a uh, local holic. Mm -hmm. uh, met Will because uh, we've done, I don't know, a few million dollars worth of transactions together. Uh, Kevin, good to finally meet you in person, sir. Uh, funded uh, some projects for, for Kevin and Will's uh, personal portfolio. Um, I am from Philly, live in San Diego, probably going to be moving to LA next year, but I still get really active in PA, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, for most of my network is. So um, I work with investors, giving them money to uh, fund their projects, purchases, refinances, development, 
just uh, walked through a, a, a block in Center City, Philly today that I didn't even know existed. It's a 100 block of Mole Street, mm -hmm. 22 um, row homes. It's a family trust that owns it. And uh, I was meeting with uh, an investor that he was just approached to, to purchase all of them from the family trust. And they're trying to do a repositioning and list all of them as, as a retail sale. So uh, it's pretty exciting. It was like, I didn't even know this block was here. And he's like, yeah, they're they're like all tenant occupied and the family wants to sell all of them. I was hmm. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are the types of conversations I have on a, on a daily basis. Pretty cool stuff. So That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Kevin? Uh, not mentioned already, retired federal agent. Um, geez, my wife and I uh, bought our first rental property even before we got married. I think it was around 2007, Philadelphia, Elmwood Avenue. It didn't go well. Um, <laughs> uh, we had it for about four or five years. Uh, the woman that we had in there, it was a Section 8. She, her health just went downhill. And uh, I think she had other people in there living with her that were not supposed to be. The, the place was trashed. We had it redone, got out of it. I uh, did a Maserati. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You're doing it wrong. But, uh, I, I think whatever they were doing in the house might have earned them a Maserati. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I uh, you know, had the pleasure of uh, meeting Will through our uh, martial art association, if you will. And uh, uh, I had purchased a house from a bank. The bank actually came to me uh, if I wanted to buy it. And uh, another friend said, just offer a ridiculous amount, low amount. They took it, which was interesting. And then uh, I asked Will to help me sell it. Or I think Aaron did, actually. Aaron might have contacted our mutual friend from the karate school. And uh, we eventually sold it. Um, he sold my father's house when he passed. He helped my daughter buy a house. He helped my sister-in-law buy a house. He I guess in the last couple of years, uh, sold my mother-in-law's house. But uh, how we got involved, there was a property in Drexel Hill that was going on the market uh, at a, um, I guess auction. Call it an auction. Yeah, yeah. I'd never been to one. And I said, listen, would you like to go? He said, yeah. It was during the summer, maybe 2020, yeah, it was I think. High to COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went and we said, okay, we'll look through it. And there were a bunch of people there. We determined how much we would go. I think we said we'd go up to 134000 or something of that nature. Yeah. And then uh, as soon as the bidding started, I think I got one bid in and then it <laughs> shot up. It was crazy. I think the woman who eventually uh, got it, she bid 300 and something oh, thousand. Lord, so wow. But eventually you contacted me and said it fell through. Yeah. You couldn't do There was it. no way. We, we didn't. Yeah. We didn't pursue it, yeah. but as we were walking away from that particular uh, auction, I said, uh, listen, would you like to maybe, you know, partner up and, uh, you know, we can do it together on it. I'll give you 60%. I'll just take 40. And he said, no. He said, but I'll do it for 50, 50. <laughs> and so from that, it's been over four years. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. Kevin and I have about 30 units together. And our goal over the next year is to double that. You know, we're selling a few and 1031 exchanging them. So, and going to different market, right? And that was, we'll get into a little bit more of that in a little bit. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so I started uh, investing in real estate probably 2018, I guess I bought my first uh, rental property. And bought another one in 2019. And in 2019, I bought my first flip. Finished that up. Uh, I did that one with my son. And then uh, I started doing flips with my brother. And you know, we've probably done maybe uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 of them over the next five years. And uh, I also do have done other flips with my son. Will sell, just sold one uh, just the other day, and uh, and then you know we and then I have some rental properties uh, with my son also. So I have some with just me and my wife, and then some with me and my son. And me and my wife don't want anymore. Like I, I don't want to deal with you know, all the headaches. But my son's son's a young buck, and he thinks he can take over the world. So 
I said, you know what, I'll buy as many, I'll, I'll go in on as many as you want to run, but I'm out, you know, like as long as I'll get them ready to be rented and then you deal with Mrs. Smith, I'm done. So, uh, so that's where we are. And now we're, now we're looking to go into different markets and see if we can kind of, uh, it speed up the process because it's it's just gotten ridiculously hard to get around property for a price that you know I want. So yeah, so we're looking to go in that direction also. Okay. What's going on, guys? My name is Chris as well. Um, 27 years old. I work for an insurance broker down in Radnor. Um, just got into this recently. Just closed on a duplex a couple months ago. Uh, kind of been a disaster in my opinion, but we'll thinks otherwise because he's he's seen it all so um, just trying to get my feet wet figure out the game uh, learning a lot from these meetings and you know talking to other people it's nice to meet all you guys and hopefully we can exchange numbers and at some point do some business together sounds good awesome uh tamika hey everyone i'm tamika parker i'm on the william holder realty team um, Will helped me purchase my first home, and then he helped me purchase my first investment property, and then I joined his team, and I've been learning so much. I'm so glad to be here, and hopefully I'll get a chance to meet you all one day. Awesome. And Tamika, you have uh, the one investment property, or up to two now? Two now. Two now, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, um you know, this is, I'm not going to go into like the, obviously, just so you guys know, don't sue me. We'll get over that quickly. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so in terms of the 1031 exchange and kind of going back into some of the conversations we had, um, you know, and uh, I have a story about Chris, but I'll just tell it when he comes back. You have to understand what you're building so you don't get frustrated, right? It's easy to get frustrated when people aren't paying, you got squatters, a, a deal is costing you more than you thought it would, you're, it's taking longer than it should, the people that you think you should trust or you, know, you think you're starting to screw you, like contractors, things like that. And be patient with it because eventually it becomes this, right? If you massage it right, it will loosen up and you'll find a way to make it work. Now, I'm not saying every deal will always work, but, and that's something you have to know. If it sucks, you can offload it. It's not the end of the world. You can start over. But in real estate, the rule is, and you hear it over and over again, it's buy real estate and wait. It's not a quick game. Like you're not going to get rich overnight. It's going to take a long time. And the people you see now that are scaling up at a high level and they're putting out all this content, they've been doing it forever. You know, like they've been, even though some of them, like I'll use Brandon Turner, for example, he's a bigger pockets guy, beardy Brandon, very nice guy. Seems really down to earth, but he's super popular. He's wrote a bunch of books for bigger pockets and he's up to like, 8,000 units now, but he started off with a, I think he was a police officer in Seattle and he bought a, a single family, fixed it up himself. And he's 37 now, but he started when he was 21. Right. And he's, he's not buying, he's syndicating. So like he owns a certain percentage of these 8,000 and he's probably the like majority partner or whatever, but he's not, it, it took a long time for him to get to where he is. And a lot of correct moves, a lot of things had to fall into place. And he had to end up on a massive podcast and people would see him and recognize him and fund him. That stuff just doesn't happen, you know? Uh, Alex Rodriguez, a lot of people don't know this, you know, a lot of people, you know, we make fun of him for the steroids, which is true. But on the back end, he has, I think, 6,000 units as part of his portfolio. And he said every time he got a paycheck, he would go buy a duplex. Like that was his thing, you know? Uh, I heard this on the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary. I never knew this. Arnold was like, you know, lifting weights didn't get me rich. Real estate did. He was like in the 60s when he was lifting and, you know, moved over to America. It's like, luckily, the guy who was like his mentor 
was like, Arnold, you got to buy real estate. Like, you know, yeah, you're winning these competitions, but go buy real estate. And he was, he was buying real estate all over Hollywood with his money. And he's like that, he made his first million in real estate, not in acting, not in bodybuilding, none of that. And he's like, that's what gave him the confidence to go into acting because he knew he could give up bodybuilding because he had this money from real estate, right? But that took time. That took like a decade, he said, to make that worth what it was at the time for him to be able to make moves. So all of these people are connected to real estate. They're just really patient and methodical about it and understand they're playing the game, right? Um, people that come in that they're like, man, I want... <laughs> I have a guy on my team, uh, uh, he, uh, I tell the story in front of him too, but his name's Kirk. And Kirk like bought an investment property. He's like, well, I'm gonna quit my job and become an investor. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> it was like, this is like five years ago. I was scared for him. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, I quit my job. I wanna do this investing thing. I'm like, well, with what money? Like you just quit your job, you know? Like, and I think he regrets that to this day. Like he backed you know, his way out of that. But keep your day job. You know, I tell everyone when I'm going to be selling real estate for a long time it because makes you look a lot better on paper for financing. That's for sure. That's the other thing. You know, it, it makes you look a lot better for sure. Um, and it, it makes it easy, you know, and there's that book and we call it the go giver or something, but it's about this guy who, you know, works in an office, young guy, he's stressed out. He's trying to be the number one sales guy. And there's this old guy that shows up every day and, super happy and just sells like crazy doesn't seem stressed at all and he's like how does this work for you because like, i got real estate and it doesn't matter if i'm here or not he's like but i'm here because what else am i going to do sit at home with my wife you know so like that's you know that's the 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 reality and i see it my partners at remax classic they're 65 they don't need to be doing this they've been doing it forever they have real estate like well what are we gonna do <laughs> sit at home you know like we're bored we want to sell real estate we enjoy it um or want to work, we enjoy it. So like, it's easy to enjoy your job when you don't have to do it, right? Um, so that's the the end goal of all of this is to get to that point where you don't have to work. You're still going to, because that's how we're built, most of us that want to do stuff like this is, we're not sit arounders, you know, like we go a little crazy. I can't sit on a beach and relax and read a book, you know, <laughs> so it's not for me. Um, I can hang out and play and, you know, have fun, but I'm not sitting quietly. That's 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 difficult for me. Um, and I think most people I've met that are either getting into some sort of business ownership or real estate are like that. Like they have that like, what's next? You know, I got to get up and go. We're serial entrepreneurs. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is, Papa. <laughs> yeah, and you got to learn to say no sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And you listen to all these guys that are super successful, and most of them didn't hit till. They're doing it 10, 15 years, you know, whatever business it was, you know, I, I, uh, um, I, you know, I, it's like Joe Rogan, for instance, his pop, his, he didn't get his first show till he was like 35 or something. And he's like, that's like, that was finally when he could pay his bills, you know, and now he's signing hundred million dollar deals through Spotify, you know, like, but it, you, people see that and they're like, oh, he was an overnight success. No, nobody yeah. really is. The overnight one years even. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, the patience, but understanding this is part of the end goal. You know, the 1031, the moving money forward, and scaling up to bigger things. Put that on your, you know, the top of the mountain and climb up. Um, so I'm going to stop the Zoom to make it. Thanks for being here. And we're just going to chat. Um, and I uh, hope you guys learned something great today.